morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, verse 12. This will be a verse for this week. It says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay. Uh, I guess technically this is our second week within regard to a, uh, just a series on addictions. Um, first week, just quickly review, we analyzed and we saw that Addictions are a choice, and we'll see that again. We'll see. Well, I'll keep bringing that up, but the fact is, it's it, they're they're a choice of the will, and then that all sin is addictive. Uh, we kind of uh, veered off the uh, last two weeks with regard to just victimhood, and then uh, last week we saw that uh, you're a victim if you're not in the power of choice, but nevertheless, it's still something that can be overcome. Uh, so you don't have to be brought under um, the bondage. Um, now. I'll make a distinction within our series, and that is this, that uh, the only lasting victory anybody's going to have over any of addictive behavior is through the, through the blood of Christ. Okay, so you can have, and I've actually met a number of folks that they're not believers, uh, but they have a great amount of personal self-discipline and even, uh, you know, I guess you could say good character to them, uh, and they don't allow themselves to be brought under, or they're able to overcome I guess you could say through fleshly means and natural means, uh, just by sheer willpower, discipline, and other other things. Uh, but the only real lasting victory would be is is going to be through through the blood of Christ. I say that because uh, though you have uh, victory, you might have um, you know overcome and and not um, give in to the temptation. Uh, you, you're still always going to have it, and ultimately even. Even as a saved person in your flesh, you have human flesh, you have the world and you have the devil that are attacking you. Um, Christ, uh, the, the Word of God teaches in Romans 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and a number of other places with regard to the fact that uh, when you're in Christ, you're, you're freed from the bondage of sin and that sin is no longer your master. Uh, and so you can, you can have lasting victory. It is possible. So, uh, just establish context here, 1 Corinthians 6, this is Paul addressing the church of Corinth, and he is um, dealing with them in particular, uh, at this point, uh, a number of things. He's gonna, he, he starts off at the beginning with regard to their partiality, the fact that they are um, aligning themselves with either I'm, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ, or I'm, a, you know, I'm of Cephas. Uh, and then they have that division, so he spends the first three, uh, almost four chapters going into that, and then he addresses the fact in chapter four uh, with regard to the fact that, um, you know, we're stewards. So uh, looking to, uh, you can say, a, a quote-unquote a hero, uh, we're in First Corinthians 6, uh, is somebody that, okay, you can, you can mark them in, as being admirable, but the fact is you, you, you're, you're to follow Christ, and uh, Christ's body is not divided. Uh, chapter 5, he starts dealing with fornication. So 5, 6, and 7 uh, deal specifically with fornication. Um, he, it seems like he kind of jumps a little bit at the beginning of chapter 6 with regard to the issue of bringing brethren to uh, court. And then um, <coughs> saying that, well, the way he puts it is, Know ye not that you shall judge the angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And um, that bringing a brother to court uh, uh, before unbelievers. Uh, he says, now therefore there's a, a utterly a fault among you, uh, because you go to law one to another, why not rather take the wrong, and why not rather suffer yourselves to be uh, to be defrauded? And then here he goes off, I guess you could say it in his curses, and then know ye not that the unrighteous and not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And, and he brings them a reminder, and such were some of you, 
for you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And here, here's where he establishes, okay, all things are lawful for me, or lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So, um, that's the context of this. He's addressing with the fact that their previous behaviors, they're no longer in bondage to. Okay, so now there's, I guess you could say, a, there's a freedom, there's a liberty, but it's a liberty to do the will of God, the will of Christ. Uh, but he says something interesting that I want to point out. Uh, I just want to establish the context of it, and he says uh, here that I will not be brought under the power of any. We saw that last week again. He reiterates that in chapter 9, where he talks about that he keeps under his body. Uh, lest by any means that when he's preached to others, he himself should be a castaway. And so he keeps reiterating this idea of the fact that my body is, I'm the master of my body. Uh, you know, my body doesn't control me, but I control it. I will not be brought under the power of any. So it's a choice, it's a willful choice that a person makes to submit either to the temptation or to the will of God. And, uh, and so a, a person being found in bondage uh, by and large is because of a choice of their will. Uh, they, they choose to put themselves in that position. They choose to, uh, to succumb to the appeal either from their own flesh uh, from the world or from Satan uh, uh, with regard to temptation to sin. There's a quick excerpt that I'd like to read. Um, I'll make a recommendation of this book with a few caveats. Uh, this is uh, put out in 95 by a gentleman named uh, Walter Fremont and then his wife Trudy was the one that co-wrote. I know. Oh, I'm you're familiar? Bob James University. Yeah, okay, yeah, yes. What's it called? Uh, it's, be it's called Becoming an Effective Christian Counselor. Um, there's actually a lot of material in here that's very helpful. The only, well, the caveats that I have with it, some, is that there's um, Calvinistic leanings in it. Uh, much like, uh, any of y'all familiar with a uh, gentleman by the name of Jay Adams? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for, all right, for those of you... I don't know much about him, but I've heard the name. Okay, for, uh, for those of you that don't, he is um, a strong proponent, I guess one of the guys that spearheaded what's called neuthetic counseling. And the idea behind neuthetic counseling is basically uh, that sin is a mental issue. And so you, or addictive behaviors, things that you would encounter as a counselor. Now they approach it not from a pastoral standpoint or ministry standpoint necessarily. They approach it more as a, uh, like somebody like a therapist or a psychologist, somebody that you'd go see for counseling or treatment of that nature. So um, he addresses the fact that most of the people that come to him uh, and even that, uh, well, in one of Jay Adams' books, he, he recounts an uh, anecdote, an incident where he goes into a mental ward, and that a lot of the people that would, that he dealt with one person in particular in the mental ward, a young lady, but that most of the people that, if he were given free rank to be able to go into a mental ward, that most of the people, if one, they got saved, and then two, they changed their thinking about um, primarily their behaviors around with regard to sin and other issues, then that would solve their problems, okay? Um, there are physiological aspects, we'll get into that, but none in this lesson probably, um, that affect a person's behavior, okay? And then that, there you have nutritional uh, deficiencies, uh, you have, you know, other factors such as like brain tumors or things of that nature that affect somebody uh, in, in how they think and how they, how they do things. Uh, you're physically tired. Even uh, I know most of us can even attest to that. As far as when you're extremely tired, you don't have enough rest, or if you're sick, then a lot of times that affects you. That puts you in a moody, uh, moody, moody state to where you're not. Um, I guess you could say acting right now. You need, you know, you need to get rest. But um, anyway, so caveat with it primarily that he has 
uh, Calvinistic leanings, and then they also um, they like to uh, blend a lot of like just regular. Um, I can't think of the Basically, human-centered psychology. But if you're on if you're on the lookout for that, then it, you'll you'll be able to pick that out pretty quick. But he does have a lot of in in the way the layout of the book is. Uh, that they address um, primarily how our society is rooted in. He, had, he he says there's seven root sins that affect American society by and large, uh, and then that when you deal with somebody, when you're trying to diagnose what the issue is with them, that you want to look at the root, or you want to try and discover what the root is. There might be numerous root issues. Uh, but the fact is you're, they're coming to you because they have some surface issue by and large. And uh, if, you know, if they wanted to deal with the root, uh, it's not that they don't, but necessarily they may not be aware of the fact so that you want to deal with the root rather than a symptom of, of what the root is producing. So if you can deal with that, if you can diagnose that, deal with that, or there might be multiple, then, then you're going to be able to go somewhere with that. Okay. With regard to addiction, uh, here's the definition that was given. I, I think we spent the first week defining it, but he says, addiction is habitual, obsessive over-dependence on a thing, substance, or a situation to meet a craving for love, pleasure, or satisfaction. Okay? Uh, so repetitive pleasure-seeking behavior that is habitual in spite of moral, physical reasons that should rationally preclude its practice and displaces uh, spiritual obligation. Now, he's approaching it as you're dealing with somebody that would be Already, uh, already a believer, uh, but nevertheless, it still would affect somebody. The fact is, by and large, most addicts uh, choose their behavior on the basis of how to deal with reality. Um, you do have, and you see this a lot more with kids than you do with anybody else. But the fact is, a lot of times kids are just experimenting, and then they get into clutches. As far as, it, in the, as with regard to substance abuse, and then you have a, a, a physical dependency that's developed there. Uh, initially, they just started out, okay, we're experimenting, we're trying to have fun, or we're trying. They they believe the lies that are told them by either other adults, uh, they're by the media, um, by the you know by their friends or peers, and then they try it. They have this sensation, and then it's like, okay, I'd like to reproduce that. And the next thing you know, now they have a, a physiological dependency beyond just a psychological dependency. On a certain substance, but it's not limited just to substances. But you also have different like uh, behavior uh, issues, uh, pornography, uh, or um, overeating would be another one uh, that can be uh, that could be an, an addiction. Uh, uh, people, but by and large, it's something that people do because they can't cope with reality. It's an escape for them. Uh, they feel that they have a lack in their life, and they have uh, something that um, I, I, I just don't know how to face. I don't know how to deal with it. And so what they do is they turn to the substance or this behavior that causes them, uh, well, a, a, a sense of pleasure and escape for the moment. And then they come off of that, and then they go back to whatever the reality is, uh, usually something pretty tragic. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, and in order to, to continually deal with that, they, they seek that. And it's a coping mechanism. Uh, it's, a, it's a twisted one, but it's really a coping mechanism as far as being able to deal with life in general or just the hardships and difficulties of life. Now, here's the thing. Um, you can find alternatives to that, uh, but the problem is foundationally they're thinking that they have that I need this or I need that uh, in order to be able to cope, to be able to face life. Uh, if you're going to be dealing with somebody on that basis, and then what you do is you approach that root, which is their sense of uh, dependency, the, what, they're, what, they're, what they're looking towards uh, to, to help them cope or help them get by or help them get along. 
um, you know, you don't need a substance. You don't need to um, be it smoke or drink, uh, you know, or drugs. Uh, so a lot of people choose to over, to eat eat, eat uh, uh, junk food or, or eat. <laughs> I know it seems kind of silly, but it's the truth. There's a lot of people. Um, you see this. Well, you see it more with, um, I guess, Christians. Uh, they might not turn to substances as far as like alcohol or drugs, but yeah, but they, they'll turn to, you know, uh, eating junk food, uh, especially like when you got somebody that's depressed. You know, they'll sit around and then they'll oversleeping is another thing. You know, or they can't sleep enough. Uh, so then they, you know, they they binge out uh, watching a show on Netflix or something like that. They have. Uh, a coping mechanism that they turn to that really isn't any good for them and that's not doing anything for them. The reason why is because they say that, well, if they know God, well, God, basically, you're not enough for me. Okay, they have a misconstrued uh, outlook on who God is and what he can do for them. Okay, they don't depend on God. Uh, they don't obviously believe his word with regard to the fact that he gives promises that we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. He promises also that if we would, uh, in Philippians 4, like we were looking at last week, uh, we, uh, if we cast, well, Peter put it like this, we cast our care on him for he careth for us, uh, that in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and then the, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, he's, he shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so the fact is, I get peace in exchange for my problems. I give God my problems, He promises to give me peace. Uh, so I can't cope, I can't face life. Uh, and I don't have to be uh, in bondage uh, to that, to um, what it is that, that I find myself in bondage to. Starting verse 57. Okay, and it came to pass that as they went in a certain way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and bird of, birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, and go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Another said also, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, uh, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back uh, is fit for the kingdom of God. Okay. Go to, let's say, Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. Uh, verse 34. Okay, and then when he had called the people unto him and his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up my take up his cross and follow me. Okay. So what does it mean to do that? Take up a cross? Yeah. Um, well, the cross is literally the place where you die. It's the death of my dreams, my ambitions. Speaking figuratively, literally, it's a place where you die. It's where you're put to death. You're killed for whatever crime that you've committed. Uh, by, uh, that was under Roman law. Uh, we know that Christ was crucified, uh, but he committed a crime. He was 
doing, he was in obedience to the will of the Father with regard to the fact that he gave himself, you know, the just uh, for the unjust. Uh, so he was fulfilling prophecy there with regard to that, but he was not, he was not guilty of any crime. But as far as taking up your cross, that's where he died. Okay, so the, where he states here that deny yourself. In other words, um, my, my dreams, my ambitions, it's not that you don't have plans or you don't follow through or carry out things like you're just living aimlessly, but the fact is uh, who I am and what I am about is supposed to be about what God wants and, and not me. In other words, when I, when, if I'm going to be living a committed life for Christ, it's going to be about what he wants, not, not my own will. Uh, now, the reason I, I brought this up is that Okay. Loving self predisposes a person to sinful rejection, feelings, and addictive behavior. And then, obviously, over, overcoming addiction is a matter of choice. Uh, as an aside, okay, a, slight, a factor that may predispose a person to addictive behavior is the root problem of sinful rejection feelings uh, from childhood. And I know it seems kind of silly, like, okay, all, oh, you know, I feel like my parents didn't do good enough for me, or uh, you feel like you're deficient in some, some way. That you missed out on life in some in some way, and you want to blame it on somebody else. But the fact is, you are where you are because of the choices that you made. And so, as a coping mechanism, what they do is they turn to something else. Um, and the root of that is ultimately just selfishness. Okay, you know, I want what I want, and they're not. Um, now, as a believer, the fact is, your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. Your your body's not your own. Uh, you know, you're. Everything about you is not your own. It's literally on loan. You're a steward of what God has given you so that, you know, um, your eyes, what you look at, you don't have any right to look at anything that would be displeasing to God. You don't have any right to listen to anything that would be displeasing to God. You don't have anything that, any right to do with, with your hands, with your feet, with anything of your body, except for what would be pleasing to God. Now, God's given a purpose, uh, and he's given a plan with regard to what he wants you to do um, with the life that he's allotted you um, so that you would be able to be well-pleasing unto him. Your task then is to, uh, in Luke it tells us that actually, it, it'd be the same passage, but it, he, he adds the word daily to it, that I, if I'm going to be somebody that's going to be committed to Christ uh, and I'm going to be well-pleasing unto God, I am supposed to not only seek him first, put him first, um, but I'm supposed to deny myself and take up my cross uh, daily. So I die uh, so that Christ lives through me, with me, in me. Um, the, the idea there basically, it's Romans 6, I yield my body not to do the will of me, the will of my flesh, the will of Satan, uh, the will of my mom and dad, uh, but rather uh, I live um, to please God. God alone. In other words, I, I yield my body as members of righteousness unto Christ, unto God. Uh, I don't have any right to make plans independent of what God wants for me. Um, and so, foundationally, any addict is going to have, well, if they're not a believer, they need to get saved, because that's really where true victory is going to come. Two, uh, following salvation, uh, they need to daily yield their body uh, as, as instruments of righteousness unto God to fulfill God's will for their life. With regard to that, uh, something that is helpful, we'll see a little bit more of this uh, next week when we start addressing uh, the. I'm going to use material that's not obviously not original to me. Uh, are you? has the ten principles uh, with regard to fighting temptation and dealing with sin and overcoming uh, you know, addiction, having victory in your life as a Christian. And uh, we'll, we'll be dealing with that next, next week specifically, but something that helps is the fact that um, if you are not headed in a direction, if you don't have a path that you're actually actively working, uh, like a plan, 
In other words, if your your life is not scheduled, not some people do this a little bit more meticulous than others, but nevertheless, the fact is you have to have something that you're working towards, a goal, uh, something that you're trying to achieve, a purpose. Now, God gives all that in his word, and he gives all that at the point of salvation to us. Um, but as far as on a daily basis, how that is carried out is I seek God in his word, I come to him in prayer, and then I should have a time during my week where I literally plan out my days and schedule through um, so that I have things that I'm working towards and I have behaviors in place that would keep me from having the idle time that leaves me open and susceptible not only just the influence of my flesh, the devil, the world, but also if I'm working towards something, I'm, I'm occupying myself in something, then that takes that time that I would normally have maybe free uh, away so that now it's a deterrent basically for me to give in, to just um, be open and have that, that uh, negative influence in my life. So rather than allowing that to be the place, uh, be, be the case, the um, Bible tells us in Proverbs that um, the prudent man foreseeth the evil and then hideth himself. Okay, so you have that long look not only have the long-term goals, but also the short-term goals that you're working on and working towards, and then having that plan that you're actively working through so that um, you you can go day by day, day by day, day by day, uh, actively seeking to please God and be in good conscience, well, pleasing, rather than giving yourself uh, that openness and that leeway for uh, sin to have its influence in your life. Is there any questions so far? No. Okay. Go to Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. Starting at verse 16. Okay, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh, for the lust for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, uh, you're not under the law. Okay. 16 through 18. 16 through 18. Yeah. And then uh, starting at verse 19. Okay, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In case you missed something. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And, but rather, it says, okay, but... Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then they, they, they that are crucified, or they that are Christ are crucified, the flesh with the affections of lust. Okay. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. All right, morning. Uh, Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Okay, so here is one of multiple recipes. And this is repeated again. You see this list similarly in Ephesians, uh, starting in chapter 4, going into 5, and even a little bit into chapter 6. But um, And that is this. Uh, your flesh is going to naturally produce something. Okay, And the only product that it can, it's, a, it's able to produce, that, that it's able to, to bring out is, he gives a list here, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. This is you and your natural state. By the way, this is, he's speaking to believers here. In context, he's been addressing the fact that um, to the church of Galatia, they are not uh, obligated 
under um, Jewish law because Christ is the fulfillment of that. Uh, so rather, it's not that uh, the law isn't any good, but the purpose of the law was to them to Christ. In other words, it was to point out as a schoolmaster to point out their deficiencies and that they would cry out to God. Um, and so they're like, okay, well, what do we do then? Well, you walk in the Spirit. In other words, Christ is a fulfillment of the law. Um, you're not seeking, you can't be pleasing to God just by keeping the law. Uh, in other words, because you're right. your righteousness are as filthy rags. So the only thing that would be pleasing to God would be Christ's righteousness, which you have when it's imputed. Uh, which, at that, at when you get saved, that's what, that's what is imputed to you. So now, rather than seeking to be justified in, in God's eyes, uh, by keeping the law, rather what you do is you yield yourself. Uh, so in a sense, it's, you're still carrying out, but it's a different motivation. Rather than trying to seek peace with God, uh, rather than try and be righteous before God, rather it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, um, it's an acknowledgement of, of the reality that, okay, Christ made me righteous, uh, not because I'm a, a, any worth of value, but rather it's because it, he placed value on me. And he's the one that uh, he put his righteousness in me, and so what I now do is I live in light of that fact, and now I'm free uh, to be able to do the, the will of God, because he addresses that also in the beginning of chapter 5, that we're not supposed to use our liberty uh, as a cloak of maliciousness or covetousness. Um, uh, we're supposed to rather use our liberty um, for, uh, for basically fulfilling the will of God, what, what was it originally intended. So my flesh, left unchecked, as a believer, uh, is going to produce the same things as the natural man's flesh. And that is the only thing it can be. Uh, it can produce adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and you can go down through the rest of the list. But rather, he says, okay, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Uh, that is what comes out when you have a spirit yielded believer, spirit-controlled believer, somebody that says, okay, God, you have free reign and you have control of my life. And so God's going to instruct, he's going to direct, and as you yield to him, uh, this is what's going to be the product of your life, even in a sinful body. Uh, so it is possible uh, for uh, an addicted individual to be able to have not only just victory, uh, but he's able to go ahead and have, you know, something long-lasting and worthwhile come out from his from his body and his flesh while here, uh, if he yields himself to Christ and to the will of God. Uh, Christ has made every provision for you to be able to go ahead and have victory. His intended purpose. Uh, if we go to well, let's go there real quick and uh, we'll finish up. Romans chapter six. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many as of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Uh, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, uh, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay, and then he's um, explaining a little further, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Uh, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto Sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And then here's our admonition. Likewise reckon, yourself, li likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so God's intent uh, with rescuing us when he, when he saved us 
wasn't simply also that we okay we would have a home in heaven and that we you know we would have this uh, inheritance incorruptible undefiled faded that faded not away reserved in heaven for us uh, but he he wants it to actually be practical now okay and how that's practical now is that I'm free from sin it's no longer my slave master I don't have to obey it uh, and he's made every provision for me here so that I would live in the newness of life okay so there's two aspects uh, of redemption first off is that Christ died for our sin okay so he paid so that we would be free he, paid, he made the payment for us but he didn't just stay dead he rose again from the dead three days later uh, so that we would have newness of life Okay, so I now am able to have new life. Okay, not just have sin to pay for, but I actually have new life now. Uh, and everybody that's ever trusted Jesus as their Savior, the same condition they find themselves in. You have new life now. And the way that's lived out, he says, is that I'm supposed to reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin. In other words, from God's perspective, once you got born again, this is the case. Right? It doesn't feel like it. Uh, for us when we trust Christ quite often, but the fact is this is reality from God's perspective. What I need to do is I need to change my thinking to align myself with what God says in his word about it. If I've trusted him, then the reality is, is that he's changed me. Okay, He's put his spirit inside of me, uh, and I'm no longer you know, a slave to my sinful desires. I'm no longer a slave to the devil. That I'm free. I can actually do the will of God in my life. I can actually be well pleasing to God, and that's what He wants. And the only way for that to be the case is I need to make that uh, willful choice. That you know, God, this is your body. God, you know, this is your life. God, and anything that is allotted to me that I have is actually God's, and I yield myself. And I yield that to Him, and I live in light of that on a daily basis, working the plan. Uh, that he's put for me uh, to, to, to be able to carry out. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. I think it's uh, real helpful to uh, choose to do what God wants you to do and get busy doing God's will, and you won't have near as much trouble uh, with the old nature. Uh, if we're always kind of going against the old nature, well, it's quite a struggle. But if we're uh, yield to God, it just comes more naturally. Yes, definitely. Uh, next week we'll be looking at the Ten Principles uh, from, well, they're in the Bible, but as far as the Ten Principles put forth by, uh, in the RU program. Uh, and uh, they'll, you'll find them to be very, very helpful. I know I am. Okay, so, do we have any questions? Or any more? Uh, we're dismissed.